relations. Um, a wonderful topic. It's a long agenda, as the ambassador remarked. Uh, it's one that we look forward to hearing his views on. Uh, for a long time, the centerpiece of American foreign policy, I believe accommodation, has been that Russia would find her place in the world in a position commensurate with her power, her history, her people, her resources. And I think it's the common wish of citizens of the United States and the American government that that indeed uh, come to pass. Um, at the moment, of course, there are a variety of issues between the two nations. The most recent we've uh, looked at in the paper, of course, has been a, a trade-off of some kind hinted at between uh, Iran and its nuclear weapons on one hand and uh, American defensive missiles in Eastern Europe on, on the other. But one looks around the world at Kazakhstan, at uh, Latin America, the Middle East, and elsewhere, and uh, the problems are numerous. And we very much look forward to the ambassador's views on these matters. The ambassador was uh, received degrees from two institutions. He received one from the Moscow uh, uh, Physics, uh, Engineering Physics Institute. He also received a degree from the USSR Academy for Foreign Trade. He joined the Foreign Ministry in 1977. From 1981, uh, for about eight years, he had interesting overseas posts. The first is Second Secretary uh, of the Russian delegation to the United Nations, and then as first secretary uh, in their embassy here in Washington. He then returned uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for at least a decade approximately, uh, serving there in a, a several different capacities. One is deputy uh, director of the Department of uh, Scientific and Technical Cooperation. Uh, he served in, and I should say that came after his serving as deputy director of United Nations uh, or, or international organizations. The uh, post as deputy director, though, of, the, uh, uh, of international scientific and technical cooperation was first of all to the USSR foreign ministry and then in the Russian foreign ministry. And he rose to being director of that same department, uh, of course, in, in the Russian foreign ministry. He then was director, uh, again, of a department uh, this time, uh, security affairs and disarmament. And from there, he went to Belgium as ambassador to that country and also as the permanent representative to NATO. He returned to Moscow, where he served in the most impressive and, and uh, position that really undergirds his, uh, uh, his uh, presentation tonight as deputy foreign minister for five years. From there, he became ambassador to the United States in 2008. It's an enormous pleasure. We're very, very honored to be joined by the ambassador of the Russian Federation to the United States, Sergei Mesyak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bird. It was a wonderful presentation, and I was pleasantly surprised how well you used knew my biography. Even I didn't remember when I was working in the Soviet Union Ministry or in the Russian Federation. Thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to thank everybody who, could, who helped to make this event possible. It's not only a pleasure, but a great honor for me to be here with you and to discuss a very simple question as to what we are going to do in our bilateral relations. Most probably, you would expect me to give a simple answer today. What is going to happen tomorrow? Are we going to be friends? Are we going to be foes? And the answer most probably is that I can tell you today what the hopes are, but how things will develop will depend very much on our reciprocal ability to deal with the issues that we haven't been able to cope with so far. On the 6th of March, that means uh, on Friday, there will be a first meeting between Secretary of State Clinton and my minister Lavrov in Geneva. 
that is expected to be a moment that will help to set off the whole chain of uh, contacts between our countries with the new administration of the United States. And it's a good opportunity and time, I think, to look around and to take stock as to where we are and maybe why we were where we are. And uh, to consider uh, as to what it is that Russia wants and you said you know better what the US want and whether we can do with the most problems that are uh, common to you and to us today in the world together. Where we are. I would say that a uh, month ago I would have said, and I did say it at that time, that most probably we were at the worst point in our relations after the end of the Cold War. When I was asked whether we were returning to the Cold War, I said then, I keep saying it now, there is no basis whatsoever for the Cold War between Russia and the United States. We are market economy. We have different but similar system and values. We want to live in peace. We want to develop our country. We have enormous amount of problems that we need to deal with in the country, diversifying economy, raising standards of living. And living as any Everybody else uh, living calm, peaceful, and comfortable life with our families. I think basically the same would be true with the United States. But for us, what is important is that the environment around Russia is stable, predictable, and peaceful. Now, what's wrong with that? Nothing wrong. But we have different appreciation as to how this environment needs to be built. After the end of the Cold War, we had maybe sometimes uh, unfounded expectation as to each of us will become to each other. The US most probably expected that after the Cold War, Russia would be one of the countries that takes uh, uh, positions of uh, Washington as a uh, ultimate wisdom and agrees with the lines that are offered to us uh, just because we ended the Cold War. But we also have interests. In Russia, there were in expectations that since the Cold War was over, the United States automatically will become a friend, friend of the, with the capital F, uh, which didn't materialize either. There were objective reasons why. We certainly were moving from different directions. We were building a new country, building it almost from the scratch, going through a very difficult, I wouldn't call it experiment, but a difficult period of going from collective ownership of the assets of the country to something that we want to build as a reasonable and socially oriented market economy system. Social oriented doesn't mean return of socialism. That means that a market economy with accent on the, on the well-being of normal people. We have started a very difficult process. We were going through very difficult uh, uh, debates in Russia, sometimes less than mature, because we, have, we were very early in our process of building democratic institutions in Russia. The United States were with us, sometimes advising us on uh, things that were correct, sometimes less so. But at the same time, we have uh, understood that bit by bit, especially late in the uh, 90s and in the beginning of the 2000s, that the US have their own agenda that they are trying to impose in the world in order to serve US goals as they are seen here in Washington. We saw a number of events that certainly create difficulties in our relations. We saw the beginning of the war in uh, Iraq that certainly creates a lot, a lot of difficulties in the region that is neighboring to us and not necessarily to you. We 
saw the first war in Europe after the World War II, launched by NATO, where the United States took a lead. And that is something that was changing the map of Europe by force for the first time after the World War II. We have seen uh, a number of other events, smaller and bigger, expansion of NATO among them. Uh, expansion of NATO isn't just a th theoretical issue for us because NATO as an organization was created as a military institution and it remains so. So far, we are not satisfied. It, NATO has changed its prime uh, functions. And that means that at the core of it is still a military instrument that has to serve the security interest of NATO members. We have seen in Kosovo, we have seen in uh, Serbia, that sometimes NATO take decisions that do not necessarily fall in what we would characterize as a legally proven action. And that means that decision-making process of NATO is something that can cause additional problems in the future. And NATO is expanding. New membership of NATO wasn't necessarily the most uh, proactive in building better relations with Russia. At the time when I was serving in NATO as a Russian ambassador, and I happened to be the first Russian ambassador to present credentials to the Secretary General of NATO back in 98, uh, my colleagues in NATO countries were telling me that uh, the moment uh, new countries will become members of NATO, they will become better friends to Russia. I didn't understand this reasoning at that time, and I understand that it was wrong now. Unfortunately, a number of countries that came there, they came with kind of... Um, uh, I wouldn't say uh, uh, willingness to pay back the historical animosities uh, that had been accumulated during ages and ages of our difficult sometimes relations. But what proved to be the case that with the expansion of NATO, NATO hasn't become more friendly and more cooperative with Russia. At the same time, we tried twice to build uh, new relations with NATO. First, it was signing of the Founding Act. That was the document that uh, laid uh, political ground for us being present in Brussels. That was one of the reasons I uh, showed up in Brussels as Russian ambassador. We were trying to build relations that would be focusing on challenges uh, that we all face in the world. Certainly, NATO has still its vocation to protect security of NATO members. At the same time, people in NATO were telling us that they are willing to use this mechanism to address new challenges like non-proliferation, inter-ethnic hatred, uh, regional conflicts, uh, narco-traffic, many others. Sounds good to us because those challenges are as difficult for you as they are for us. Some of them are closer to us than, than to you because the whole bed of a number of conflicts is uh, in our immediate neighborhood. And we thought at the time that by building cooperation on issue other than Article 5 related, Article 5 of Washington uh, Treaty being a commitment or rather obligation of NATO members to help each other in case of attack. So if we put aside this question, we are no longer in the Cold War. We are no longer uh, posing threat to each, uh, to each other and focus on a positive program of fighting together the international challenges of the 21st century. We thought we could have built a better understanding with NATO and maybe to influence its policy and its philosophy and its long-term thinking in a way that would be proactively cooperative with us. We failed. We failed the first time when NATO decided to launch a bombing campaign against the sovereign country, Serbia. We thought it wasn't legally uh, 
justified, politically wrong, and uh, we saw a very difficult uh, campaign on the ground with a lot of casualties. And uh, of course, the situation in Kosovo wasn't an easy one. But we insisted that we should have worked together and tried to f uh, find a political solution. And here we failed. We didn't have uh, a relations for a short period of time. Then we tried again. We had a Rome uh, summit of NATO countries in Russia where we have charted a new document that would be focusing our relations on new challenges as I outlined them. So the idea was to build a real partnership, serious partnership, on security issues other than Article 5. We failed. We failed and it, uh, in substance because we haven't been able to engage NATO in a really serious partnership. We believe that if we do agree to work on a problem, we need to define what the problem is, what the challenge is. We need to agree that we want to address them together, and we need to bring our respective capabilities together to combat the challenges. It sounds simple, but it didn't work. It didn't work as far as we are concerned for one simple reason, NATO wasn't ready to be with us in a joint mechanism, to take joint decisions with us. Whatever we try to do in the basic important issues, the answer was basically that NATO will have to decide what it wants for itself, and then we will tell how you might wish to join. But the problem is that if you do work uh, seriously as partners, you need to build uh, cooperation in substance. That means we need to bring our people to work with NATO people in Brussels, and they, they need to bring to work with ours. Needs to we have to have a joint chain of command. That means we need to have a joint supply routes and everything. But being joint with Russia proved to be very difficult for NATO. Joint with Russia didn't work, and still does not. The very last test of our relations with NATO occurred after the events in South Ossetia, where NATO countries, with the help of the United States, decided that they do not want, I'm quoting, to have relations as usual with Russia. All work of the Russian NATO Council was uh, suspended. And as we speak, we do not have official cooperation with NATO. There is none. There are some contacts on an official level, and we will see what will happen next. But what is the most di disappointing to me, especially as one who had started the process uh, or was contributing to the beginning of the process of building relations with NATO, that there are no relations between Russia and NATO, and the world hasn't changed. It hasn't become worse or better for you. It hasn't become worse or better for us. That means NATO-Russia relations haven't acquired maturity or substance that would make a difference either for you or for us. And it's very disappointing, very disappointing, because I think we could have done much better in, in the, all these years that we were trying to build our partnership. Reaction of uh, NATO to events in South Ossetia certainly uh, is not something that was unexpected, taking into account the re reaction of the United States, because that was the uh, extension uh, of your policy, first and foremost. But at the same time, I think uh, that we did have a lot of things to do together that are important to you and to us, and we did continue. We uh, do continue working on fighting terrorism. And the disruption in our relations, uh, the way it had been prior to that, didn't affect us. We have been working on the non-proliferation 
of nuclear weapons, and we still continue. For the United States, it is very important to have uh, our support for Afghanistan emission. We understand it, and we will be supported. We are supported. By the way, I think it was yesterday or today that the first cargo of the, uh, of the supply uh, for your forces in Afghanistan went through the territory of Russia with the permission of the Russian government. So we uh, continued economic cooperation, and I'm very, very satisfied that despite all the ups and downs in our relations, the businesses says, of both countries do believe that they stand to benefit from cooperating. We never put any brakes on it. We believe it's healthy, it's important, and needs to be encouraged. And I would say that uh, last year, in uh, the year that was uh, not very easy for our respective economies, our trade has reached a volume of both ways, $36 billion. Uh, sounds impressive, but not too much for the economies of the size of the United States and Russia. For you, it's about 1% of your foreign trade. For us, U.S. is somewhere uh, 12th or 13th uh, as a uh, biggest economic partner. But what is important, dynamics are good. Some five years ago, the trade was four times uh, less important. We started building this uh, trade from the level of eight to nine billion. And within this short period of time, we have reached 36. If that dynamics would continue, however, the current economic crisis certainly isn't the best environment for that. But we will be better off in terms of overall relations because we believe that economic relations is an excellent underpinning for political dialogue and interaction as well. We did continue to invest in the Russian, uh, in the American economy. When I say we, I mean not the uh, Russian state, but rather Russian business. One of the results of it is that I'm standing here talking to you because one of the contributors is Cyril Stahl that helped to organize this uh, event, and it operates on Russian capital. It's multi-billion investment. Some five to ten years ago, most probably we wouldn't be very pleased to see our Russian capitals flowing from Russia and going to the United States. Currently, we believe that uh, it's something that is healthy because it's a mutual process. Within the same period of time, three to four years, we invested eight billions here. The United States invested eight billions in the United St in Russia, and it's good and it needs to be further encouraged. And it goes in line with what. President Putin and President Bush agreed back in uh, Bratislava in the joint statement, they said that they will try to encourage mutual investment. That was a new term, mutual investment, not only that we were seeking your investment in Russia, which we do not mind and certainly would welcome further investment. But we do encourage Russian legitimate business to, inv uh, to invest in uh, legitimate serious business in the United States that only improves the connections between our economies and that means better predictability and reliability in the long run. But at the same time, we all witness during the fall that, uh, especially on the backdrop of the events in South Ossetia, there were difficult months and difficult weeks in our relations. When I came here that was, uh, in September, immediately after the events in South Ossetia, I was still listening and hearing arguments that Russia was an aggressor, that Russia was uh, invading, had invaded uh, sovereign country. Even at that time, in the uh, middle of September, we continued hearing here in Washington that Russia launched a war presumably to topple a regime that they didn't like. It was wrong from the very beginning. I have never seen in my professional life a kind of, I wouldn't call it the disinformation campaign, but 
a case, a uh, very simple uh, situation, so misrepresented in the mass media here in the States and uh, elsewhere in the West. And it took about two months, I think, for the facts to surface up and to become known. And then when we started talking, I think, more seriously with the American government and started looking for ways and means to rebuild our relations. But the facts on the ground were very simple. The president of Georgia ordered shooting, point blank, Russians. That's simple. That simple, nothing more, nothing less. They were shooting Russian peacekeepers with T-72 tanks. And Russian peacekeepers didn't have means to respond because first, they didn't have the orders to respond. Secondly, they didn't have weapons to respond because peacekeepers have only Kalashnikovs uh, on their laps, and that's it. And they were shot at point blank by T-72 and finished off those wounded. Peacekeepers who had been helping to keep peace, uh, keep peace there. And then the MLRS, multiple launch rocket systems and long range artillery was used against the sleeping city of Tsin Valley. Sleeping city in four hours after the president of Georgia addressed them through the TV channels, announcing the ceasefire, announcing that he would not allow his forces even to uh, strike back if provoked announcing that he was the president that would protect their life and safety. And in four hours, he was shooting at them with multiple launch rocket systems. For those who do not know those systems, they do not target any precision spots. They cover surfaces. We had to respond. We had to protect people. And by protecting people, we had to bring relief for the civilians. We had to push the Georgians uh, from Tsinvalia. We did. And as a result, we were blamed to be aggressors. We were blamed uh, to have been trying to undermine legitimate government. And I ask sometimes, uh, and I felt very deeply about all of this when I came, what the United States would have done had hundreds and hundreds of your citizens would have been should add point blank by T-72s. I leave to you to answer. Now, we live through a different period. You have a new uh, president, a new administration. We have been very carefully listening to the signals that we are getting from Washington now. And I would say the signals are good. They are serious and positive. We certainly understand that there are a lot of problems that we need to deal with in our relations, in our bilateral relations on the international arena as well. But I think the tone and the uh, readiness to reboot or restart our relations, first of all, is very important. Secondly, it's very timely. And third, I hope it's sincere. So we are looking forward to this beginning of new dialogue between our two administrations and the new leadership here in Washington. I would add to this that uh, it's pretty unique a situation where we have a president that will be serving this term at least three years and a half uh, to go. Yours, four years. They are both new to the presidencies. They're both young. They are both people who uh, were, have grown up and matured maybe not as a result of the Cold War time and mentality. I think we have a good chance to start building relations that would be drastically different from what we had seen so far. When I heard the argument that NATO and the United States didn't want to have a relations with us, uh, or other business as usual, uh, I would say we do not need business as usual as it had been so far. We need it different. We need it based on the mutual respect of uh, interest. The simple formula is for the United States, if you want an advice, 
take our interest the way you want us to take yours. It's certainly too generic to be uh, equally applicable to each and every situation, but as a rule, that would work. We will reciprocate. And if you take the international agenda that you face and we do face as two big countries, they are very similar. Once I try to draw the list of things that unite us and the list of things that uh, uh, brings us apart, and the first list is three times more lengthy than the second one, non-proliferation is still there. The danger of uh, terrorists acquiring means of mass uh, annihilation is serious. And it's something that we need to deal together. Neither one of us can cope with it alone. And maybe two of us cannot do the job either. It needs to be global, and Russia and NATO can and should lead in this fight. We have a lot of international conflicts. Middle East, we are the US and Russia, together with EU and UN, the leading num uh, uh, entities in the quartet that helps to uh, build bridges and build peace in the region. You have started the Annapolis Conference a year ago, less than a year ago. We are planning to have a follow-up to Annapolis in Moscow. We are trying to build it together. It's in your interest, and it's in our interest. Non-proliferation and Iranian and North Korean aspects of it. We have been working in different formats, in the six uh, with the Europeans on Iran, and with China, Japan, and South Korea on North Korean issues. And I think that those instruments are still valid, and you cannot find a solution if anybody of us will try to do it alone. But together, we can. It's not going to be easy. But I think if we work productively, that's the only solution that can be found. Financial crisis. It's something new to us, to you and to us. Maybe unexpected, at least in the big, a year ago, we in our thinking about building American-Russian relations, we didn't necessarily focus on the financial crisis in the United States and its aftermath in Russia. Not always, we are in a very bizarre situation. If you compare, for example, with the uh, mentality of our respective uh, people, say, 20, 25 years ago, at that time, if had you had a uh, Economic crisis of the type you have now, a lot of uh, Russian uh, theoreticians and uh, specialists on Marxist economist theory would say that it's uh, only a proof that capitalism is wrong. Most probably we wouldn't mind too much your crisis at that time. Currently, we are in the, in the dependent world. We are also part of world economy, which is different from what had been the case 20, 25 years ago. And that means that there are pluses and there are minuses. You have a crisis that started predominantly in the United States and spread out all over the world, and it affects us as well. We also take the heat, most probably not in terms of relative uh, terms, not as uh, painful as in the United States so far. Uh, but since we are a younger market economy, and that means more vulnerable, we have the problems that can explode into the future. It's not only about uh, the price of oil falling down. It's more, and most importantly, uh, about uh, employment, jobs for the people. It's about social protection of the people, because our economy is still need to mature. And there are a lot, a lot of people who would feel the heat more than the others in the time of the crisis. The government is trying to do whatever they can. And uh, so far, we were rather, uh, I wouldn't say successful. It would be too, too optimistic to say. but. Uh, the crisis hasn't exploded, and our economy is not going to implode. And one of the reasons is that during the years of relative prosperity, we have accumulated rather significant uh, uh, reserves, about 600 billion 
that was prior to the crisis. We have spent already, I think one third of it, to help the banks, to help social programs, to encourage internal consumption. So things that are not unfamiliar to your ear after all these debates on the economy is uh, so, uh, uh, encouraging packages. We do it a little bit differently. We do not uh, invest uh, uh, in uh, companies. We help with the credits. We help to secure the credits. But we also help people who can be very difficultly affected by the crisis. So because of these important reserves that we had accumulated prior to the crisis, uh, the government isn't going to change a single social economic program that it has been budgeted this year and for the next year. We will pay the pensions. Moreover, pensions have been increased and are going to be increased once again. There will be additional programs to help uh, with medicine and many other things. We will have to use part of the wealth that had been accumulated in Russia prior to these events to help to smooth out the impact of the world crisis on Russia. But being in the same boat now, we certainly are interested very much first that your economy recover fast. Secondly, that the international economic and financial system become more transparent and more predictable, not only to a couple of countries that are most actively operated, but with, for all others who are also contributors and are affected by this decision, that means us. And we are looking forward to the uh, next summit of the 20 that is going to be held in April, early April in London. There, our presidents will be present, and I wouldn't be surprised if they have also a bilateral meeting. Well, we certainly hope it's going to be the case and that would be the first and most probably that would be the beginning of a long journey together. And we hope that based on the intent here in the United States to work with us and willingness in Russia to work with the United States on a positive and mutually respectful agenda, I think we can do much better than we have done so far. But we are not naive. There have been so many problems uh, piling up in our relations that they need to be dealt one, one by one in a more serious and respectful way. One of the very first, and I would say time sensitive issue that needs to be addressed is um, the issue of strategic arms limitation. We have an agreement, a start a treaty that expires December 5th. If we do not have a follow-on arrangement with you, that means that all of us will wake up in, uh, be, uh, on the 6th of December in a situation where there are no limits on strategic missiles. And by the way, there are no limits on um, defensive strategic systems. The only limit that will be still uh, present is a limit on the warheads. Uh, it's a Moscow treaty that will uh, expire in 2012. But otherwise, it's free for all. And uh, that's a recipe for a resurrection of their arms race. We do not want it. We want our relations in strategic area to be well predictable, regulated on a mutual basis and in a way that will maintain stability on the lowest possible levels. And we need to go lower. We sense the willingness of the American administration to go this way. We welcome this, but we are still waiting for administration to be able to work with us. We treat with full respect the problems that organizationally uh, the new president has because uh, he has to appoint people to work with us. And the State Department, uh, the specialists that will be dealing with this issue are yet to be appointed, are yet to be approved by the Senate, the same in Pentagon and elsewhere. And when they sit in the chairs, they will have to have some time to put the act together. And most probably, that would also take some time. But the time is ticking. 
on December 5th, the treaty will expire. We have been talking to the American administration, previous administration, for quite a long period of time, but we have we had very different views as to the wisdom of the arms control arrangements. We are glad that the new administration came with a different philosophy. We need predictability in strategic area. We also are looking forward to hear more about the views of the American administration on a number of other arms control issues. And uh, so far on a generic level, what we have been hearing encourages us in thinking that we can work together. But the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. And we will see how things will transpire. So that would be my brief introduction. And I would certainly be interested in your questions and answering them if I can. Thank you very much. Ambassador Kisiak, we thank you very much uh, for your overview. We look forward to the answers uh, to our questions. The floor is now open for questions. Thank you. Uh, I subscribe to the Washington Post, a newspaper notorious for its uh, russophobic news coverage and editorial policy. Um, the Post has been particularly aggressive in criticizing Russia for alleged raising, allegedly raising prices on gas sold to Eastern European countries. But I, a careful look at the Post's um, business section indicated that these were not, in fact, price increases, but reductions in subsidies. Uh, and that begs the question, why would Russia continue to subsidize gas prices for Eastern European countries? Thank you for your uh, question, because it contained the answer. <laughs> We had said to our uh, friends and neighbors that uh, the Russian taxpayers wouldn't be willing to subsidize other economies, especially in the difficult times that we're going through. For example, with Ukraine, with which we had uh, another crisis uh, on the eve of the new year, the overall uh, support that the economy were getting from subsidized prices was about uh, two billions plus minus a year, two billions. It's quite an impressive figure. And that is very much needed in the Russian budget for Russian taxpayers and for Russian social economic programs. We sell the same stuff to Belarus, much more expensive than we did for Ukraine. We were selling the same stuff to Europeans, uh, our partners, for the price that was much, much higher. And uh, our Ukrainian friends, they, um, especially in the last year, they didn't pay for quite a long period of time. We were trying to remind them that the payment was long overdue. And only in December they would remember, oh, yes, 1 billion 600 million. So we, we acknowledge that it's something we need to pay. Our calculations were a little bit higher because there was some percentage for the uh, payments overdue. And they didn't find any better uh, solution uh, but uh, to cut off uh, the transit routes. And that was, as far as we're concerned, was an attempt of blackmailing us and putting us in a difficult position in our relations with the Europeans. So the choices were either we continue first subsidizing uh, economy of the uh, neighboring country, secondly, uh, live with gas not being paid, that's another two billion, plus two billion uh, of uh, our subsidies. And uh, Russian uh, taxpayers wouldn't understand that. And it, it's not feasible in any uh, market-oriented country. I can hardly imagine that you would be selling your, what, Fords for the price uh, that would be half of what you have invested in building this car. That means that your taxpayers will be paying for this. I hope that this crisis was the last one, but uh, we will see how things will develop in Ukraine. They seem to be in very difficult situation economically, 
But most probably the most biggest problem for them is the political turmoil that they are permanently in doesn't help to get out of the economic situation that they are in. You mentioned one of the most sensitive areas is the um, expiration of the Strategic Arms Limitation Control Treaty in 2012. If this expires, would that give a green light to the weaponization of outer space? That's an area I'm very interested in. Thank you. The current agreement expires not in 2012. The start agreement expires in December 5th this year. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this you year. said 2012. In 2012, there is another agreement, the so-called Moscow Treaty, that limits, puts a cap on the number of warheads that we have on both sides. And the cap is from 17 to 22 hundreds on each side. That is allowed under the, the Moscow Treaty. Uh, but the current treaty, it provides for limitations on uh, missiles, also on warheads, on date deployment, on strategic bombers, all this stuff. So that's the one that expires in December 5th. Now, it will expire. What, the question is not whether it will expire or not. It will expire. So the question is what we are going to do next. We hope that we will have another follow-on agreement that will continue the process and hopefully on the lower level and hopefully going down uh, in the future even more. Uh, but I do not believe that it would be uh, immediately tantamount to a weaponization of space. Uh, it's a little bit different problem, but it's a problem that is, uh, has its own uh, importance and urgency, I would say. Urgency because we have seen the United States having tested your anti-ballistic Aegis system in the uh, anti-satellite mode. When the satellite was falling and you shut it down, mm -hmm. it was already testing of it. We saw a problem when our two satellites collided that created enormous amount of debris on the orbit. It's another problem. That will be a problem for new assets that will be put on space for Russian or American interests or European or anybody else because these orbits are the ones uh, that are most important for economic development. And if we understand that any collision uh, uh, intended or not intended on the orbit is dangerous. But even it will be even more dangerous is we will see uh, weapons deployed there. Because that means that all the assets will be at danger. It will be very difficult uh, to reverse the situation had the uh, systems been deployed in uh, orbit. So the only way to uh, deal with this issue in a more or less meaningful way to prevent it from happening. All these years we have been advocating an idea of having an agreement that would be monitored by all of us that would prevent this from happening. So far the United States were adamantly against it. Against it uh, and uh, during Several years of uh, voting in the United Nations General Assembly on the draft resolution that we put together with the Chinese and fully supported by all EU countries. The United States voted only, I think, with Israel against this uh, resolution. All other members of the United Nations were supporting the resolution in favor of an agreement to prevent weaponization of space. I would like to say that the uh, President Obama uh, seemed to have formulated your uh, attitude towards this problem a little bit more nuanced way. And uh, we are yet to understand that. We are yet to discover what is uh, the details of this new position. But uh, if you look carefully on the position that was posted on the internet by President Obama, it is more encouraging because he is speaking in terms of the need uh, to prevent the appearance of the hostile, uh, what, what did he, he use as a term, uh, hostile activities in the outer space. That's, that's very good and I hope we will, we will work on this. Uh, ballistic missile defense. Um, 
these defensive missiles have never worked. The uh, Star Wars by Ronald Reagan was a fantasy. The present series of missiles have been a basically a dismal failure one after another. And I'm glad to hear that you're a physicist. Uh, physicists of the American Physical Society have looked at this carefully, said this isn't going to work. And so I think it's a waste of money for us. I think President Obama will conclude that. So I'm wondering if you feel that Russia is worried that they will work, or if you think maybe that if you believe they won't work, does this change your attitude towards uh, what you should do about this? I think that we came to the conclusion that it isn't going to work effectively. And that's one of the reasons why we are not building the same system. We had rather developed potential in the Soviet Union in anti-ballistic area, and we were maybe even ahead of you at some point of time. But we came to the conclusion that we are not going to build it for ourselves because uh, it's uh, ridiculous. At the same time, we have to be responsible when we define our uh, military strategy, defensive strategy. And you build, if you build it, that means there might be a moment when the United States military or politicians will decide that they have a good protection to filter out the remaining uh, uh, incoming missiles after the first attack. And they might be tempted to go for blackmail. It's simply a kind of scenario from the Hollywood movies. But since we have these missiles, since we haven't abandoned uh, deterrence, mutual deterrence, we have to be sure that our deterrence will work under all circumstances, under all eventualities, today and in the future as well. So we said for ourselves, and we said it to the US government, you, when you decided to abandon the ABM treaty and whatever we have seen so far unfolding afterwards is a result of your decision to abandon the treaty. We said that we were not going to follow the suit, but we will uh, undertake measures that will be asymmetrical and that will be able to deny your capability to protect uh, US against uh, uh, Russian deterrence. So far, we still live in an area of the era of deterrence, and the deterrence capability needs to be credible. It's more political, of course, than uh, based on physical calculations. But try to imagine the responsibility of a president of my country, of the military, who will see that there are new and new installations being built in Alaska, future in Europe, in Asia. And if you look at the map, it kind of encircles us. And we understand that at least a significant part of it is going to be a embryo for a capability to address Russian systems, if not now, but in the future. We understand that. And we also have people who can calculate ballistics, who can calculate uh, probability of the uh, intercept and everything else. And we will be doing whatever is necessary on the minimal level, but to be sure that whatever happens on this side, we will protect and maintain our credible deterrence. Unfortunately, our last question. Yes, sir. Sir, good evening. Uh, Mitchum, First Class Murtar from the Naval Academy. Uh, earlier tonight, you mentioned uh, the Russian reasoning for entering into South Ossetia. Uh, I was wondering if you could compare and contrast both the Russian attitude towards Israeli involvement in the Gaza Strip recently, as well as uh, current U.S. involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> I think it's difficult to compare. I think that... Uh, our Israeli friends, they certainly have a problem with these incoming uh, rockets. But the way they uh, reacted with so massive uh, campaign of bombing, it was a hit against civilians more than against the, uh, the capabilities of those who were uh, attacking them. It was done in a way that wasn't helpful. In Ossetia, we were protecting civilians and we didn't do anything more than uh, to protect. The whole operation was called a peace enforcement. We pushed the Georgians out of uh, reach uh, from Skin Valley. 
we pushed them at the distance from which they couldn't attack Tsinvali because we were bringing relief and supply, those were civilians, and we needed to protect the civilians. We took out the assets that would be helpful to once again to try to attack because they, especially at that time, they were threatening to continue. We took out the uh, artillery, we took out the uh, airstrips, we took out the, some Navy uh, assets to deny them capability to attack. And we didn't do anything more. We never f uh, hit any civilian targets. And even the Europeans, after they went there, after the, this conflict, they discovered that those civilian infrastructure in Georgia is absolutely intact. There were a couple of houses affected. But what was shown here sometimes was very wrong. Uh, there, are, there have been cases where Skin Valley, destroyed by uh, uh, Georgians, was shown on your TVs with the voice uh, uh, of the commentators suggesting that they were uh, showing the city of Gori, that is on the Georgian side, which was wrong. Gori has never lost even electricity or running water. But in Skinvale, it was almost Stalingrad. It was destroyed enormously. In Iraq, what the United States have done, I think, is a monumental mistake. Monumental mistake. We said at that time that it was wrong. We have never changed our position on this issue. Certainly today, we all need to look uh, for many ways and means to have peace back there. But how many hundreds, uh, thousands of Iraqis were killed? And for what? And the war was launched based on information that wasn't, hadn't been proven and proved to be wrong. And the war wasn't justified. It wasn't mandated by the Security Council. It was a great, great mistake as far as we are concerned. Now you are coping with the results of these mistakes. Thank you, sir. I don't know if that's the best point on which to end the evening. <laughs> Let's have another question. <laughs> However, I, I think the ambassador has been very, very helpful to us. Thank you so much, sir.